And then that last hymn was very um, appropriate for the message this morning. And just as the Father gives us things and withholds things, so our earthly fathers do that. That's how they show their love for us. And we will see that from the scriptures this morning. Uh, I did want to let you know uh, that Tom Tingle called us, contacted us uh, yesterday late and said that uh, Liliana Liliana is in the hospital. She had uh, her gallbladder removed and uh, there were some other things that they had to do that it kind of left her in a lot of pain. So be praying for that. And uh, I uh, told him that we would announce that and she was fine with that as well. So be praying for her during this time. Let's bow word for a word of prayer. Father, we look to you now for this time in the service as we delve into your word. Lord, this, the topics that we're going to be looking at this morning are those which are very pertinent in this day and age when we find so many things in our culture that are contrary to what the Bible says about parenting and fatherhood and motherhood and all of these things, Lord, it seems like our, our nation has just turned everything upside down. And I pray, Lord, that we as believers will know what you have called us to do. I pray that as we look into your word, that if there's been any question, any uh, doubt, any misunderstanding about what our role is as fathers, that that would be dispelled and we would own it. We would take responsibility for it and we would be the servant leaders that you have called us to be. Thank you for the men that are here this morning and their, uh, their families and all of that re represents. We pray that you would transform and change all of us into the image of Christ, our our God, the one who commanded us that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So Lord, we thank you that you are our pattern. And I pray even as we have sung this morning that we will emulate our Savior and Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Someone once asked a woman, is there anything worse than blindness? And she said, oh yes, a person with sight and no vision. That was Helen Keller. <laughs> she probably more than many people could see without her eyes. And she had several um, frailties and yet in an incredible way she overcame them. I, I think and that the thing that so many men are lacking today is a vision for their families. I had an idea when we were young and we began our family after we were married, I had a, a vision of what some things looked like. Um, I grew up in a, a good Christian home. Many people would have thought it was an ideal home, but every home has its weaknesses. And I thought I knew what discipline looked like. I remember, uh, I honestly don't remember a lot of discipline when we were young. That doesn't mean that we were never spanked, we were. But um, I always remembered that my father uh, dealt with things very uh, nurturingly, and tenderly and yet firmly when, it, when that was needed. And, but I found that when I came into really uh, rearing our children that I didn't always have the vision for what, uh, for what they needed to be. And I'm thankful that I had a wife who had a lot of vision for what it took to prepare them for life. And 
I find that oftentimes it is wives that carry that vision and burden for their family. And we as husbands, we kind of grow up thinking, well, it's our job to do the, you know, the, the heavy things, the work things, maintaining the house. And yet sometimes we struggle with the idea of relating to our children in a way that is meaningful and that shows that we care and we love them. And so as men, it can, it's, it can be easy to become distracted. There are many distractions, aren't there? There are things like sports. And we can do sports with our kids. That's not, sports isn't a sin. It's not a negative thing necessarily. But many men are so involved in sports or either, you know, watching sports that it really takes important time away from their family. And many things are necessities. And I, I think we all become overwhelmed at times with all the things that we have to do. That's the way life is. I remember Les Olala, who was the president of Northland Baptist Bible College for many years and Northland Christian Camp, and he told, he was actually speaking. He didn't say it to me personally. It was, he was speaking, but he was saying that the older he got, the more the responsibilities seemed to just pile up. You know, when you get to a certain age and you're, first your kids are in grade school, and, uh, but then you get to where your kids are teenagers and then your parents are aging and you're finding you're having to make decisions about that and it seems like it just gets bigger and bigger. Your kids go to college, you're trying to earn money maybe to help them through college or uh, show them how they can make money for college and then they get jobs and the, the, the family is going every which direction. And it's not like it was when they were younger, when you had them at home and you came home at five o'clock or whatever and they're all there, you eat the meal together and then you can do things as a family. Life gets more complex. And I, I want us to look at the responsibilities of a husband and father this morning and we're going to be going to several passages, passages, not just one. And I hope that this will be helpful for all of us. For those that are uh, fathers now, it'll be a reminder. For those that aren't fathers, uh, you, I hope it'll help prepare you for that and get you mentally ready and, and not only mentally ready, but as a man ready for those responsibilities. The first... Um, responsibility. I want us to turn to 1 Timothy 4.12. 1 Timothy 4.12. This is not a passage that actually is addressing fathers as such, but I believe it is one that we can take that very easily and um, superimpose it on the father. As you've been told before, Paul was writing to Timothy, and when he wrote to Timothy at this time, he was probably around 40 years old. Now, how many of you are around 40 years old? Let's say within a couple of years. Anybody that's around 40 years old? How many of you are younger than 40? Of the men, I'm asking. Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you are older than 40? Okay. And Timothy was probably around 40 years old. And just for your um, peace of mind, he said here, let no one despise your youth. So if you're 40, you're still, you can still be defined as youthful, all right? But notice he says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. I don't know, and the Bible doesn't tell us whether Timothy was a father or even a husband at this time. But I believe the place we need to start as fathers is by being an example as a believer because if we aren't the example to our family, then all is lost. 
there's inconsistency. When we try to require of our children certain things, but we're not requiring it of us, we're not living up to the expectation ourselves. And that will cause bitterness, it'll cause resentment in our family, in our children, in our wife. And so the first responsibility is, is to be a sincere, Christ-like example in the home. What does Paul mean when he says, let no one despise your youth? Why would somebody despise your youth? Well, I believe what it's saying is don't give anyone an excuse to blame youthfulness for your actions. Don't, don't let your youthfulness be evil spoken of. Be a man. Take responsibility. And certainly, at 40 years of age, you need to be doing that. But if we've reared our sons right, they ought to be ready for that, you know, in their 20s or early 20s. And some people could even be ready before that. So don't give an excuse to blame, for others to blame your youthfulness, like inexperience, impatience, lack of foresight, but rather be exemplary in Christian character to the believers who are watching you. What are some of the most common criticisms of youth? And by youth, I'm not necessarily, it could be uh, in the teens or it could be in the 20s, but what are some of the most common criticisms of youth? All right. Okay, inexperience. Now, what does that say about our training? We need to be giving them experience, don't we? We need, to, we need to be preparing them for all of the experiences as much as possible that they will be facing as a husband or father. That's very important. And as a father, I need to keep that in mind. How am I going to prepare my son for the things that I have had to deal with? It shouldn't go on another generation where we leave them in a situation where they're not prepared. What would be some of the other um, things that we might think, uh, some of the other criticisms we might uh, have about youth? Anybody else? Don't be afraid to say something. All right. Okay. Say it one more time. Okay, they don't see the consequences of their actions. That's a good one, isn't it? And the way we prepare them for that is, is holding, holding them accountable in a loving situation because we're the best ones to do that, really, because we, we can do it and, and express love and compassion for them, but also in a loving way, making them feel the consequences of their actions. And we're trying to teach them the lessons of life. That's really important. What else? I'm sorry. Impulsive. Okay, not thinking through things and just, you know, uh, going off on their own. Impulsive, that's an important one. So you, when they come up and they're impulsive about something, maybe they didn't even tell you about it, and then you, you draw them back and you say, now, what was the problem here? And how should you have handled this? Should, should you have asked somebody about it? Gotten just to make sure? That accountability is helpful. Say it one more time. Wanting to fit in with those you. Okay, wanting to fit in with others around you and not seeing the dangers of that. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Any others? Okay, arrogant or unteachable. <laughs> Were any of us guilty of that? Yeah, you, they think they know it. They think, oh, I, I can do this. And they really haven't thought through it again. It goes back to a lot of things. But, and they need to learn humility. They need to learn to seek counsel about things. There are probably others we could think of, right? 
but those are some of the things that we face. And most of us are only patterning what we have seen in our own home when we became adults. And I think we as fathers need to realize, for instance, in this verse it says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And the most important believers in our lives are our family members. It's our wife, our children. Now that doesn't minimize our church, other believers in that context, but we had better be sure that we're a good example at home. If you lose your children, you really have lost one of the most important qualifications for spiritual leadership in the church. So in reality, we need to do both. But the Bible puts an emphasis on qualifying for leadership in a church um, as being our family, what our family is like, our family success, their spiritual maturity. And if we lose our children, we lose our church because our, our children are part of the church. They're the next generation of potential leaders. And if we are not growing into Christ-likeness as fathers, then the chances are that our children are not either. In fact, we will neg negate an influence upon our family, a godly influence upon our family. Our influence will be there, but it won't be a godly influence. In many ways, it may be worse than a completely godless home because they are hearing one thing, that is a, a, a home where we're making a profession of Christianity. Our children may be hearing one thing, but seeing another. And that does not bode well for the home. A godless home, on the other hand, is consistent with itself because it does not have a divine standard. John Payton, missionary to the Hebrides, several years ago I read his, um, his biography. It was quite challenging and inspiring. But he attributed his call to the ministry to the influence of his father's Christian testimony in the home through private prayer, family worship, and Christian character. His father was his spiritual hero, even though he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't, uh, I don't know if he, he was an elder, they grew up in the Presbyterian church, but um, he was a godly man. And he remembers oftentimes getting up in the morning and finding his father in his prayer closet praying for each one of his family members. And one of his prayer requests is that one of his, one of his sons would go to the mission field. And John Patton was that one. He was the answer to his prayers. Note that the qualities here, the qualities in which we are to be exemplary. You'll see these in chapter 4 there, verse 12. He says, be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, and so forth. So here the word, word, is actually mean, means the idea of conversation. In, in the way we speak, we are to be an example. We are to be exemplary. The first verse that came to my mind was Ephesians 4.29 where it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may, be, may impart grace to the hearers. And this, this is talking about corrupt words, words that are filled with poison, corruption, and they're toxic and they're meant to inflict emotional pain on the hearer, to cut down, to hurt, to win the argument at all costs. 
But not saying corrupt words isn't enough. He goes on to say, but he, he says that which is edifying, that ministers grace to the hear. So it's not enough even to not say anything. We're, we're to minister grace, and that's part of what is the duty of a father, is to say the appropriate thing at the appropriate, appropriate time with the appropriate emotion it stands in contrast to speaking the truth in love. Carnal words like this are often mixed with anger and wrath and sometimes even at least what appears to be hate. Those kinds of words, they don't heal, they tear down and they destroy. Now, I want you to note how often you should let a corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Is it once a day? Yeah, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. So Paul's standard for Timothy was no, not one corrupt word. And make sure that your words are edifying, even when you might be reproving, that it would be done for the purpose of edification, that you're ministering grace to that person so he'll respond in the right way. It's fun sometimes to see how quickly a new convert changes their conversation. And you see, you see them go through this metamorphosis, sometimes gradually. You know, maybe they use God's name in vain, and it was just about every other word before that. And now you only hear it once in a while, and then eventually it's just gone. Maybe it's other words. Maybe they use profane words at times. And, but God, if the Holy Spirit's in them, God is working on them. He's convicting them. He's edifying them. And they begin speaking edifying words. God does amazing things, and he can do it in a father's life as well, no matter what our background has been. And then notice he says, in conduct or behavior. You know, you have a newly converted couple living together outside of marriage and they begin to feel uncomfortable with that arrangement and so they approach the pastor or someone else in the church and wonder if they ought to get married now. Well, that's, that's, that's the work of God in their heart. And we as fathers, maybe we have a habit that we have struggled to get rid of. God can help us do that. And he wants to do that, and we ought to do it for the, for the glory of God and for the sake of our family if we love them. God can help us be victorious over any sinful habit we have. Do you believe that? Do you? I hope you do. And then we come to the word love, and it is the word agape, and this is that love that is willing to sacrifice itself for the good of another. Love is that bond that holds all the other qualities together. Back several months ago when um, Pastor Wes went through Colossians chapter 3, he noted that, and it's, it was excellent. He says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. It is that a grace that allows us to forgive others and to do it joyfully in Christ, for Christ's sake. It's a love that's motivated by God's love for us. And that's why that comparison is all, always made. In Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, he, he talks about let us do everything in love just as Christ has loved us. I wonder, do you manifest love to your children? Would your children say that you manifest love to your children? Do they feel it? Do they see it? Do all your children see that love manifested? And then the word spirit. 
What does he mean by spirit? So he says, be an example in spirit, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit, although I think the Holy Spirit is, um, is the answer to this. But in general, it's a general disposition that should give evidence of love and humility and peace and holiness and a servant's heart in our relationships with others. It's that aura about a person. When you meet them, they, they, they immediately want to meet your needs. They want to know about you. There's a spirit of humility. They're not trying to put themselves forward. They're, they want to help you. They want to encourage you. And that's really what it's talking about. And that's a result of the new man created in Christ Jesus. It's our spirit, our demeanor should have the fragrance of the person of Christ himself. Not carnality, but a spirit, the spirit of Christ. You can tell when the spirit of a family member is not right, can't you? You don't sense a, a peace there. You don't sense that there, there, there's, a, you sense that there's a barrier there between you and them. Maybe there's anger. Maybe you don't even know what the problem is. But you sense that their spirit is not right. And that's what Paul is talking about with Timothy. He's saying, be an example in your spirit that people sense this when they walk up to you. And then be an example in faith or belief. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, tells about the shield of faith. And it says, above all, take up the shield of faith, whereby you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And our lives should be exemplified by faith, by acting on faith in the word of God. When you tithe, you're acting on faith. You're saying, I'm going, I'm going to give to the Lord and I believe he will meet my needs. He's going to take care of me. He's promised to do that. When I, by faith, give to the needs of the church and to the needs of others, he will do that. And it is important that we maintain faith in the word of God by means of a clear conscience, meditation on the word of God, because that builds our faith as we read it, and then application to all areas of our lives. We, we dare not depend on our own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So often people get into problems because rather than trusting the clear teaching of the word of God, they begin to trust in their own common sense. And their common sense leads them astray. It leads them into the cultural norms of our day rather than deeper into the Lord himself. And then he mentions impurity. That's moral cleanliness or chastity. Now, we know Timothy's background a little bit. We know that his father was Greek and his mother was a believer. And Paul talks about his upbringing. He, he talks about his godly mother and his godly grandmother. And we know that he had a rich Christian heritage and he was glad for that. But not everybody that Timothy was going to be ministering to came from that background. So he's saying here, Timothy, you be an example to the believer, to the believers that you're going to be ministering to in the churches that you're going to be pastoring, 
you be an example of moral purity so that you can influence them. Now let me ask you something. Can somebody else who's had a moral, moral failure in their life, can they at some point become an example of moral purity? Yes or no? Yes, they can. So when, when Paul says this, he's not saying it to Timothy because he didn't have any moral failures. He's, he's actually in some way saying, guard yourself now because Timothy, you could fall. But he's also saying, being an example, even to those who have come out of an immoral background, and some of them had come out of great immorality, we know that some of the Corinthian believers were homosexuals. Some of them had been immoral out of their marriage relationship. Some of them had never been married and were immoral. But now as they became a believer, they can now be an example of moral purity. And I think that's important to, for all of us to consider because even though someone has fallen, they can be restored and they can be an example that is Christ-like in every aspect of their life. And obviously, the ideal is that a person be morally pure all their life. That's what we would desire. But the intention here is that anyone could change and become a godly testimony in their moral purity. Now, our, So first of all, as being an example, that's what we as fathers are to be. That's what... A, every Christian is tr to try and be. And we can only do that through the power of God. Secondly, as fathers, we are to love and cherish our wife unconditionally in front of our children. Turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26. And it says this, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And why did he do that? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the husband is the one who is to initiate love in the home. He is to be the initiator of this agape love. Now that there's one time where the wife is commanded to love, but really the pattern for love in the home is to be set by the, the husband and the father. He's to initiate love in the home by the way he sacrificially puts the needs of his wife above, above his own, even as Christ did the church. The story is told of a man who sought out his pastor for counsel and he, the pastor asked the man, what can I do for you? And the pastor, uh, he said, pastor, I think I have a problem. What's your problem? Well, I think I love my wife too much. I see. Well, tell me, do you love her as much as Christ loved the church? No, I, I don't love her that much. Then your problem is not that you love her too much. Your problem is that you still don't love her enough. <laughs> And I think the real problem with many men is that they think of love as strictly a feeling. And I, I don't think we can necessarily negate feelings or emotions. One person put it this way, defining love. Love is a feeling you feel when you feel like you're going to get a feeling that you never felt before. <laughs> and 
And if, you're, if you put it on that basis, maybe you can love them too much where you idolize them and you're, you are thinking of them as providing for you in the same way that God does, providing something that only God can give you because only God can satisfy that. Biblical love, however, is, is primarily not a feeling. And I know it's hard for us, I think even as men, it's sometimes it's hard for us to really wrap our brain around that because we think of love as a feeling. But I want you to, to look at something. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. What part of speech is the word love? I'm, this isn't a trick question, by the way. In the first three verses, what part of speech is the word love? Is it a noun or a verb? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. It's actually a noun. And, and it is also in verse 2 and verse 3. It speaks of it as a noun. As and when you get down to verses 4 through 10, it still is used as a noun. It's the very same word in the Greek. You can have a, there are, ver, there is, agapao is the, is the uh, verb form of agape. It's not used, that's not used in verses 4 through 10. It's always this noun. But notice what is verses 4 through 10 doing? It's defining love by what? by action, by verbs. So love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So in order for us to define love as a noun, we define it by verbs. It is never defined by emotions in here, but by these verbs of righteous behavior, virtuous behavior. And this is the classic passage on love. It is probably the longest passage that actually deals with love. And true agape love never uses the person that they love to fulfill their own desires, but always to do what is best for that person. So when a person says, I love you and therefore I'm going to take advantage of your purity. That's not love. That is pure lust. That is all it is. Because love protects the person that they love. It doesn't take advantage of them. It protects. It sacrifices. It shows honor and respect. It thinks no evil of them and rejoices in the truth. We often think of the wife as initiating love, but this is the husband's privilege and responsibility given by God. And this is the way a husband shows that he values and cherishes his wife. 
The Bible says a good wife is more precious than rubies, than diamonds. It's putting, that's putting it on a maybe a purely financial basis. But it, you know what? It's basically saying that a, a, a wife is what? Valuable. Priceless is really what it's saying. It's priceless. You can't put a price on it. How many of you have a, a handful of rubies in your home or a handful of diamonds? You know, there aren't many people that have that. It's priceless. That's what it's saying. The marriage relationship should set the tone for the entire home. In fact, it does set the tone. I should say it that way. It sets the tone for the entire home. If it's a bad relationship, it sets the tone. If it's a good relationship, it sets the, t the tone. It shows that dad loves mom. It shows that mom respects dad. It gives legitimacy to what parents say about Christianity in the Bible. Do mom and dad really believe what they say about Christianity? They say they are Christians, but their marriage may be a poor advertisement for that. Does dad put mom's needs above his own? Says so she makes sure she has a functioning home by providing and maintaining what she needs to capably manage the home. Do they look like they enjoy being married to one another? Have you ever seen couples that, couples that are maybe been married for 30, 40 years and they just, they look like they're still excited about marriage. Does their relationship display unity and oneness and respect for one another? Does their relationship make home an enjoyable place to be? Many times children want to get out of the home as soon as they can because they don't like it there. That's why you have young people running to relationships outside of the home, outside of their parents' approval, because they don't like what they see at home. And they want to go find it somewhere else and find somebody that will uh, look up to them and love them, and they're, they're searching for that. home is tense because of the marriage, children will want to be anywhere but home. And then the marriage relationship makes the children want to reject what their parents have. I'm sorry, makes them want or reject what their parents have. Because children can tell when there's disunity and tension in their mom and dad's relationship. And there's a reason why Paul exhorts husbands and wives before he addresses the children. I have a book in my office by Lou Priolo, who's a counselor, a trained Christian counselor, and he wrote, he's written several books, um, all of which would have been good. One on, is called um, The Heart of Anger, and talking about angry kids. It used to be entitled Ang Angry Kids. And he gives 25 ways parents provoke their children to anger. And the first one of the 25 things he mentions is lack of marital harmony. He starts it with that, lack of marital harmony. The third one is modeling sinful anger. The fourth one is habitually disciplining while anger. He talks about inconsistency and many, many other, 25. It's excellent and thought-provoking. So in most cases, he would say rebellious, angry children reveal a problem in the marital relationship, more so than the parent relationship. And as the head of the home, fathers should be the ones initiating resolution in the marriage, which probably starts by asking forgiveness. And then we need to prepare for rearing a family. 
In other words, as a, as a, in a marriage, we need to start preparing. Any couple that's planning on getting married ought to start preparing for not only their own personal relationship, that needs to be a top priority, but also their children. But focusing on their marriage to make it a top priority so when they do have children, they'll, they'll be working out problems and they'll be uh, creating a healthy relationship. How many of you feel like when you got married you were pretty foolish or novice, you were immature? How many of you felt that way? Okay. We had a lot to learn in a lot of different ways. And we look back and we might think, or maybe we look at a young couple today and we think, how, you know, they're so immature. How are, how are they going to rear a family? Well, I think we were probably very similar at that time. And I'm not suggesting that we necessarily wait to have children, but that we prepare for that by studying the Bible and, and reading some good resources. Have we read any good books on marriage and child rearing? Oftentimes we do that long after we're, we're in the problems and they're harder to resolve. Have we done an evaluation of our own marriage and home? Have we bathed these matters in prayer, asking for God's wisdom and aggressively seeking it? Have we talked to Christian parents whom we respect for their godliness and marital harmony, which has resulted in mature, godly sons and daughters? We ought to be looking and talking to those people, especially if you're getting ready to have a family, and asking them what they did. Years ago, I, I know several years ago, we had Carl and Debbie Herbster here for a um, couples retreat. And um, Carl and I grew up in the same area in South Bend, Indiana. Um, he, he grew up in Lakeville, which is just outside of that. It's a very small city. And, but after he got saved, he started coming to the church that I, was in, that I had been in as a teenager, and then I went off to college. So when my wife and I got married, we came home to visit my parents. And um, when we came home, he was the teacher for the young married uh, young married's class. And so we, we went in there that Sunday, and that was the first time we got to know him. And he and Debbie had been married for several years. They got married at, I think, quite a young age. And I think he worked for DuPont, and he was quite high up in managerial and had been successful there. But the Lord had really worked in his life. And um, their, their boys were young. They had three boys. They were very young at that time. And I, I remember he told me one time that he went up. He got with my parents one time because they reared children, and he wanted to know what they needed to do. And, um, and he just picked their brains. And he did that for several people. He picked their brains about what did they do? What, it, what was it that kept your children in the fold and um, kept them from getting bitter and helped them to grow up and so forth? And that, is, that was a wise thing to do is looking for others who have done it and done it successfully. Abraham and Sarah had some serious marital problems, and yet God used them. And we know that, but um, there were struggles there. Isaac and Rebekah had some serious marital problems. There was, there was not unity at all in their marriage. And as a result, um, their 
One of their sons was not a believer, Esau. Jacob was a believer, but he was very selfish and controlling. Jacob's polygamous marriages made his home dysfunctional by all standards. You remember David's marriages had serious problems that resulted in the death of one of his sons and one of his daughters were raped. But all of those problems were a result of the marriage. And that marriage resulted in a dysfunctional home for the children. And so we need to prepare and that's the father's responsibility. The father ought to be preparing. The father ought to be uh, introducing discussion with his wife to talk about it and, and talk about the unity in the home and how we're going to do this for God's glory, come to some very clear decisions. I'm going to finish this next week, and um, I think there will be plenty of material here to do that. We've really delved into the two most important things in this relationship and in, in the responsibility of husbands and fathers. And we kind of throw those together on Father's Day uh, because they're so intertwined. And you need to have unity in your marriage to have uh, a good result in your children. So first, the first thing was, are we an example as fathers? Are we as a, an example to our family of Christ-likeness? That doesn't mean we're perfect, but are we growing in our Christ-likeness? Are we constantly trying to grow in our Christ-likeness? And then as husbands, are we loving our wives like Christ loved the church in front of our family? Are they seeing a Christ-like love there for the next most important person in our family, and that's our wife? I shouldn't say the next most important, but the, as far as the next priority, I'm to love God as a husband and father, and I'm to love my wife. And if that is, if we're in a right relationship there, then we are prepared to also be a good father to our, to our family. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. You've not left us without what we need. You've given us poor examples and you've given us good examples in scripture. And we see so often the, the sin nature of man coming out in everybody in the family. But I pray, Lord, that you will help us as fathers to own up to the leadership and to take responsibility for these two things that we've mentioned here this morning and we will mention more later. We thank you that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We're thankful that he is the example and that he nurtures us. Help us, Lord, to take the initiative in showing and manifesting love in our home to our wife and children. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 553, 553. Lord, bless our home. Let's all stand together to sing. Families all around us are crumbling every day, yielding to the enemy and throwing life away. Find 
our lives together. Guard us with your truth. When the struggle seems too great, Lord, keep our eyes on you. Lord, bless our home, protect our home. Let it be a refuge in this world of sin. Lord, reign within. Keep us strong and true. And when we need you most, Lord, draw us close. Commit it to each other. Lord, bless our home. We give our home.